On today's episode of the Voice of Reason podcast, I sit down with Travis Haley. Travis is a former Force Recon Marine who later worked as a private military contractor for Blackwater. Travis founded Magpul Dynamics and later became the CEO of Magpul Industries. Travis is the founder and CEO of Haley Strategic Partners located in Scottsdale, Arizona, and has become someone that I am honored to call my friend. Travis Haley, how you doing, sir? Good, man. I'm so happy you're here, man. You know, for those of you um, who don't know, you know, I, I got married yesterday, and Travis and his bride to be were down here and came down, made the trip down to be with my wife and I. And man, I, I just thank you from the bottom of my heart for being down here. You, you bet, know, man. and, and uh, you know, you had to fly in from Arizona and make the trip, and and uh, now we're here doing what we're doing, and it's kind of impromptu, but you know, I said, man, let's let's uh, let's do this real quick. Hammer drunk from the reception. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No. Put them to work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Went back to the venue early this morning after breakfast and, and, and cleaned up, and I put Travis to work. So. Yeah, I was like back on the farm, cleaning, cleaning the barn <laughs> it out. It really was, back was. on the farm. Yeah, you I, went, know, I went so. into farm boy mode for a second. <laughs> so thank you, man. You know, it's an honor. It really is. So uh, let's let's get into some introduction here. So uh, for those of you who may, a lot of you guys know Travis Haley. Uh, some of you guys may not, uh, but uh, currently CEO of Haley Strategic Partners, which is a big conglomerate. You guys have a lot of stuff going there. Um, former CEO Magpul Dynamics, which is what a lot of people know you from. You know, training videos. I know I I grew up and and uh, you know watching your videos and and uh, you know trying to emulate what you were doing. Um, you know, uh, Force Recon Marine, private contractor with uh, Blackwater, um, and you got an amazing story. You know, um, so again, you know, Travis Haley, you're here right now. Um, <laughs> So a lot of you guys may or may not know Travis's story, but let's, you know, I'll give you an opportunity to kind of tell how you, how you came to be, you know, in the industry. Wow. That's a loaded question. Um, how did I get to where I'm at? I, I, I'm still trying to figure out the answer to that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think it's, it's a pretty simple answer. It's, you know, a lot of people think that, you know, when somebody's in a position of, of leadership or a position of uh, influence um, or is, is, is known for doing something like, I mean, I appreciate the, the comments about, you know, the, the accolades and video and helping people with that stuff because I love that stuff. That's that's what I love doing. Um, you know, the world's a forum. Yeah. So I, as, I think you've probably heard me say that before. So I believe that, um, you know, if you're not sharing, well, then you're not a part of the forum. Right. So why, why aren't you sharing? If you're not, then why aren't you? That's what I'd love to know the answer to that question. Um, and I think a lot, a, a lot of things would get solved if people start talking more about what's going on you right. know, around the world. Meaning not just telling secrets, everything that shouldn't be told. I'm talking about actual community talk, like be, being community, neighbors, things like that, and getting to know people again, getting to know people's problems. I mean, friends are afraid to, to ask friends, you know, what's going on in their right. lives. Um, so I think the curiosity, number one for me, to learn as much as I possibly can about life, um, that started when I was young, you know, on the farm like we were just talking about. And, and uh, so I, I kind of had to make things work. Uh, I didn't have a lot of resources growing up in the, in the swamp farmlands of northern Florida. And, um, it's a whole other world out there. Yeah, it's Florida. Yeah. yeah. Everything, got gators. everything bad happens in Florida. <laughs> so, and that, that was like, you know, that was my first job was, was, uh, catching rattlesnakes for, for, uh, belt and boot makers. And, uh, that's I not dangerous at all. I thought that was the world, how it's supposed to be, man. You know, until I started getting into electrical work and growing up and, right. and then joined the military. So I, I was, I think coming back to the word of why, um, I am in the position I'm in is because of resourcefulness where a lot of people will, um, I don't know, blame themselves or, or something else, other people. I mean, look at like a, a lot of companies fail in today's world. Why do they fail? Because they blame their own people. Right. They blame a lack of capital or they might blame the economic environment. Okay. You, you just, you say one of those, that's strike three, as yeah. far as I'm concerned. Um, you know, a lot of companies right now are trying to prepare for a recession. I'm like, well, you may not be in a recession, so be careful. Well, no, it's a recession coming. It doesn't mean you're going to be in a recession. I'm not in a recession. I'm right. not going to treat my company and my people like I'm in a recession until it's time. And that's what contingency plans are for. So, you know, balancing around here, it always comes back to the word resourcefulness. Everybody has that. That's your determination, your creativity, your passion. Um, 
your innate drive to what you're going to do in life. It's not resources, man. It's not money. It's not people. It's, um, you know, because if you're determined to get something done, you're going to get it done. Right. You know what I mean? If you really, 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 really want it done, like, look at our kids. Like, I want to really do this, but I don't right. know how. I'm like, you, I just saw you, like, code something on a computer, and you're telling me that you don't know how to do this physical skill set, like, dig a hole in the backyard. Especially okay. nowadays, man. Good luck with that. little kids with tablets and stuff and they're just naturals on it you know and computers yeah. and stuff. i didn't have that stuff growing up right you didn't have that stuff growing up and i think they're natural at that stuff like we were natural at the, the other stuff yeah. outside you know the the hard work the, the labor like this morning you know getting into mode and just going and then doing it and watching everybody else around us kind of like moseying along that's just what happens that's life yeah. man so some people are going to be more resourceful in life than others and um and i think that's something if you don't have money right time uh, experience. I mean, how many times you heard somebody at work go, that's not my job. Well, I, w- I didn't, lo- I didn't go to school for that. That's not, it's not my thing. Okay. Right. So you tell me you lack the resolve, another resourcefulness word that really helps you get things done. I think I learned that from a, a very early age about my parents, my grandparents. Um, and, uh, again, just trying to MacGyver stuff all the time, breaking yeah. stuff, fixing stuff. And, uh, and the best I, way to learn. And I think that's how I went into life was from a uh, an innate instinctual, I say, meaning conation, the instinct of us, not cognition. Um, that's what your, your original innate drive is, what your desires and your motive is going to be in life. And so for me, it's definitely quick starting and adapting and uh, always trying to figure things out the hard way. And because I, I love that process. Yeah. And I think, uh, and then I do it through an implementation aspect. I build things. So a lot of people will say, well, hey, you're a great researcher, man. All the stuff you guys came out with and science of shooting and understanding sports performance and how it works with us and eyes and blah, 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 and brain. It's like, I didn't, I wasn't the best researcher of those things. I was the best builder and implementer of teams put together to help us with that information so we can then therefore go back into the forum and share it to the world. And so I think that, has been the biggest model for me in everything I've done, whether it's weapons development companies, uh, whether it was when I was CEO at Magpul, and then after we founded Magpul Dynamics, they brought me over as the CEO of the parent company, and I went into resourcefulness mode. I didn't go into resources. You know, you'd see an assembly line that was having a lot of problems, and I would just look at it and watch it. Meanwhile, the engineering teams are going calculators and trying to figure out how to. You know, change the specs on the inline rotary girder and stuff. And, and no offense to them, they have a job to do. And I still have, have an engineering team to this day. However, if you just sit back and observe people and then ask people and be a people person and understand yeah. people, uh, I think you'll get a lot quicker results. And so that's what I would do. And it was kind of like, man, this is really helping us become leaner and manufacturing yeah. and open up more networking opportunities and fixing our performance gaps. And then other opportunity gaps would close. And you're like, holy shit, this is awesome. And I just keep doing that, keep that drive going and going and going nonstop. Yeah, when I when I got to spend a couple of days at, with you out there at, at, at your headquarters, man, yeah, I was blown away, you know. And it was really cool to see you in action. And there was no doubt, you were boss man in there, you know. Everybody treated you that, but you had a great team. And what I was so impressed with was, you let people do their thing, and you you know you guys have that amazing you know think tank of a room, the train station, you know, that thing's amazing, you know, and if, if anybody you know, ever has the opportunity to go see that, go see it because it, it, it really was cool. And, and, and I love seeing your, you know, your interns and everybody that's working in the shops and, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on there, but you were letting people do their thing, you know, and, and you, you just have a way with people, man, you're a good leader, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I did just, just bring you on the show just to, you know, puff up your head or anything like that but i, I want to well, give takes, you that it's hard man it's being a leader is not easy it's not it's not and you know i've i've been a supervisor in my agency for almost seven years man i i tell my wife all the time i just miss being an officer sometimes it's the hardest job you have to do is to lead people it, it's not hard. manage there's a difference right so if people are listening out there especially in law enforcement especially in the military yeah. from our world to where we come from and now me in the private sector in the business world if you are a manager um you probably tell people what to do if you're a leader, you probably show people what they're capable of. Right. So I think if we can start to influence our management team, our leadership team, um, with, you know, performance leadership coaching. Yeah. Right. That's that's a thing, man. Mind architecture. How do you get inside of somebody else's world? Right. Because if you start to build your company or your team, in the, and again, I wish I knew this back in the military, man. I, I would have implemented it immediately. Um, if you can build a team based on people and not performance – 
watch what happens. Servant based leadership is huge. You yeah. know, and, and there was a term that one of my mentors, you know, he, he said to me when I was younger, he said, you know, Rob, uh, it's towels over titles. You can have a title. Right. And I said, what does that mean? He goes, towels over titles. And I said, I was thinking about it. You know, what do you do with the towel? You clean, you get down on your hands and knees and you scrub the floor with it, you know, or you scrub a counter or whatever. It doesn't matter who you are. If you're trying to get a task done, don't be bigger than the person that has to take out the trash or mop the floor or clean a toilet, you know. Um, sometimes that's what it takes, right? To show that, that, that leadership, like, Hey, I'm not, you know, we need to, we have a task here. We need, we need to just get this done. And that's what I admire about you. You know, you, I watched you work, man. And you're, you know, walking in the, you know, uh, in the, the warehouse and, you know, the shipping warehouse, and then you're going over and doing some other stuff in another part of your, you know, your, uh, headquarters area. And it was just, it was cool to watch you work, yeah. you know? So I was taking notes, man, you know, to go take it back to the PD and, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I just admire that about you, man. It's hard to do all those things. You know, a lot of people ask me that, like, how the hell do you do that so much or how much, I mean, cause I try to think about what I even do in one day, um, because people ask me and they bring awareness to it and they say, well, dude, you realize what you just did today? I'm like, yeah, I just worked. I just did my thing. I love doing it. Um, and then I get typically asked the question, well, how do you do so much shit so easily? And I'm like, well, it goes back to my innate quick starting aspect of me. Like, trust me, if I had a higher follow through, I probably wouldn't be doing that. Um, and there's times that I wish I did. Yeah. And, uh, and for pe people probably, well, why don't you just work on follow through? Well, it's not that easy. That's how your, <laughs> your co-nation, your instinct is what you have when you're born and it's what you have right now. And it's what you have when you will die. Yeah. Cognitively, you will get smarter, which can help you follow through more on things like setting an alarm for something. Yeah. That would be your cognition. Instinctually, we don't, we're not born with time and watches, right? right? So you have to cognitively do something like that to give a very basic example. Um, so I, I try to share that with my entire team. My entire team is psychologically, um, I guess you could say profiled into what instinctual categories they are. So when they do start uh, doing well in certain areas, but maybe it's not their job to be creative. And all of a sudden you have to identify, well, that person is, you know, uh, more of an implementer and they're creating something. Let them, let them go. You know, yeah. uh, it's like the last thing you want to do to an athlete on the field when it's, it's uh, you know, <sighs> Fourth down, one yard line, six seconds left in the game. The last thing you ever do as coach is say, time out, time out, bring it in so I can make a plan for you guys so you can win. Right. You just fucked up. Let your team win or let them lose on their own at that point in time. Right. Yeah. That's where coordination really kicks in, and that's when you'll see your winners and your losers. Um, and then the people that you can help and share, hey, how to not do that again or give accolades to the right people that, you know, if you're doing well, you need to tell them that too. And that's hard because I'm not a words of affirmation guy very, very much. I'm, I, and that's one of the things I'm learning in, in life is, is uh, I need to say that more to people. Um, but also I lead by that example, like you're saying, getting out there with a the towel, right? Uh, but I can't do that all the time. You know, I got seven companies. I got seven kids. Uh, we got a lot of shit going on. Um, and so I have to delegate. And yeah. so as long as you're delegating, don't be the manager delegator, be the leader and influencer. Right. So that way when somebody, Hey, I, I don't know how to take that on. I know, I know it's your first time. I'm going right. to guide you through it. And I'll be there to guide that person through that first time they're doing something and then check back in with them constantly until right. they got it on their own. And then I let go of them. I don't say, Hey man, suck it up buttercup. That's what I hired you for. And if you don't do it, you're done. Yeah. That's, that's a problem. Yeah. My guys know they, they don't call me and go, Hey Sarge, uh, you know, how do you want me to, how do you want me to handle this call? That's the wrong thing to ask me, mm -hmm. right? I don't know. Why don't you figure figure out a game plan and then call me back and let me know what your game plan is and then we can discuss it because yeah. I want them to figure it out. I can easily tell them, hey, I want you to do A, B, and C, but then what am I doing? Then Now I'm running every single call coming out when I'm the watch commander and I'm like, no, now I'm exhausted. Now and I have, yeah, I, I you have can't do the rest duties, of your job. Right. I have other duties that, that I need to you know handle. You know, and I also like to put my, my, my guys in leadership positions sometimes and go, okay, what are you going to do on this call? You're the sergeant. Let's go. Right? Because what am I doing now? Because tomorrow I can get hurt. I can blow my back out, be out. That person might be a sergeant. Yeah. You know? And, or one day that person might be my boss. You and that happens every day in the world. Right? People, and that's so. okay. That's okay. And I tell my guys too, and I tell my kids, learn. And if you fail, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Because one of the, the things that I struggled with and I still struggle with is that fear of failure. And so I didn't allow myself to really be vulnerable and, and put myself out there a lot when I was younger and I missed out, you know, and there's things that I wish I would have done in my career early on that have kind of, you know, it's, it's not available for me now. 
Mm-hmm. Right. But I was afraid, like, for instance, I always want to be a motor cop, ride a motorcycle, get on a Harley, drive around, you know, those guys, that's an awesome job, but motor school's hard, you know? And I had an opportunity to Why is it test for it. Just the maneuvering the bikes. And I know ne- I didn't grow up riding motorcycles and I was afraid to get out there and really fall on my face and look stupid in front of the other guys that I was trying to impress because I was in my early 20s, you know, and uh, looked up to these guys, and I didn't want to let them down, right? Yeah. In the back of my mind, I didn't want to let those guys down, and uh, I didn't put myself out there. Well, now, I did some other things in my career that were, you know, allowed me to promote and get into the position that I'm in. Now those positions aren't available to me. So what would you say to 20-year-old Rob if you had to do that again? Put yourself out there. Be vulnerable. What does that mean? Don't be afraid to fail. Put if there if there is something that you even think that you might want to do, then do it, right? Because I could have got into that unit. Oh, it's not for me, and then just resign, go back to patrol or whatever. At least I said, you know, I could say that I did it. But now I'm, it's not it's not available for me now. Yeah. You know, and now I'm in my 40s, and I'm like, okay, and now I'm on that downward slope in my career, and I'm going, okay. Yeah. All right, you know. Well, I think especially with risk, you have to jump in. You, you have, have to. to. You have to. But you, you don't jump in blindly, man. You should always... Have a plan. You know, it's like like we talk about, you know, need versus risk formulas at work. You know, it's like, hey, you got that guy calls you, hey, I don't know how to run this call. Okay, well, sit down, come up with a plan and a process for yourself. Ask yourself what you need to do right. versus the risk that you're willing to take. Yep. What resources do you have available? And go ahead and then equalize that and see what happens. Yep. Um, you, you have to do that in everything. You have to. So, like... Would you say, well, man, can I go online nowadays and find motor, motor school, bike classes, motor, oh, yeah. uh, like uh, uh, motocross stuff? You go do dirt bike and stuff and learn how to ride a dirt bike. Then right. get on a street bike and it's, you're going to know how to ride a bike. And then you got to learn the street aspect to it. So you go to a three to five day school and probably smoke check that test. Right. In today's world. Yeah. Right. Where we didn't have that also back then as yeah. much. So like if anybody's out there like, you know, and that's listening and I always tell people, like, look, go to school. You know, go to another school before you go to a school. Well, you know, there's always a basic course. There's yeah. always somebody that can share something with you. Um, I had some guys the other day who were afraid to ride horses and uh, on a trip, like a horse riding trip. And right. I'm like, go take a one-day horse class. You'll be fine. And you'll realize how easy, you know, and eventually you'll go, man, why was I making a big deal out of that? Those are big animals. Because when you worry, which in theory, yeah, it was a worry that you had a long time ago. Yeah. When you worry, you suffer twice. One, because you were worrying, and twice because you never became a motor cop. Right. In, a the- in theory, you know, of how suffering potentially works for people. Like, fuck, I regret that. Yeah. Like, don't regret that. Go do something else. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, you have one time to do this career, and, and you know, and you turn around one day, you're 25, and then you wake up, and you're 41, 42, 43, 50, you know, and, man, life, it seems like every year life goes by faster and faster and faster. You know, so I've had to learn to really put mm-hmm. myself out there, and... Now that I have teenagers and as a dad, that's that's a big one, you know, trying to push them. Well, you know, the thing with this way, I told Adam this, Adam this last night, your, yeah. your big buddy, and we met that little guy, the little guy, yeah, seven foot Adam. <laughs> he was talking about fun his, size, talking about you know, because he's retired now as police yeah. officer, um, and he wants to build a motorcycle shop. I think is what he was saying. Yeah, in a nutshell, and and uh, he's like, bah, this and that, and he st- I started listening to this racket, as we call it, in the in, the, in the psychological mind architect world, right? It's it's a racket when you start making up reasons and considerations of why you may not be able to do that. I'm not saying he was just, like, making excuses or anything, but I could kind of see he was kind of like, man, wanting to do this, yeah. but I just want to make 100% sure before I do it, I need to, I don't know. It's like, well, I said, where do you want, where do you want to be in five years? He says, I don't know. I said, where do you, where do you think you're going to be in five years? <sighs> I don't know. Can I tell you where you're going to be in five years? Sure. I said, you're going to be five years older. Yeah. That's it. It's as simple as that, you know? And I think, you know, when you're, when you're sub 40 years old, you may not think that way. But once you get to 40 and over, not to say that I don't have, I mean, because I'm 47 almost. So I got 40 to 60, 60 to 80, 80 to 100. I got three lives to screw up or make good left. You think about that, right? Yeah. You break that. Think about from zero to twenty in your life what that was. Think about from twenty to forty, right? Those are those are different times. Those are different Way lives. Different. And so when you, that's why I, I hate when military guys will say, "Man, that second life that I had, making a military career and going out with law enforcement, we go out and we get in all this stuff and have this traumas that we try to live with the rest of our lives." It's like why? 
why you got three or four lives to li to live right if you if you can't look at it as a life and, and appreciate your entire life then let's just take it in chunks for a second for that yeah. person maybe they, maybe they're having problems with that um and that helps reconcile with that suffering yeah. a little bit more nah. so you know we again at breakfast this morning you know we, we were talking and and uh, it's kind of i think it's a good kind of segue to my next question you know um watched you for years again and uh i've watched you deal with a lot of the haters that come up and i think a lot of people especially in in the in the industry that you're in and that we're in um it's inevitable you know and and, and guys just you dealt with it in the military you dealt with it in law enforcement i'm sure I, i've dealt with it for years you know how do you deal with these guys man it's that you know that are just kind of bullies and a-holes and you know yeah, you know, man, that's a good question. Uh, uh, I think there's haters in every world, right? I think what's interesting about the haters in ours is that people forget that our number one jobs in in the defense industry that includes the Second Amendment that is the that is a defense aspect of the United States of America, right? It doesn't mean you can have a gun to carry and protect yourself from somebody breaking your home. It means you are also checks and balances for a tyrannical government. Yeah, that is a fact. Okay. Um, military, law enforcement, first responders, uh, all those things. I think the, 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 the number one mission for all of those communities inside of that world that we're in is life preservation. Yeah. Right? We don't sell cars. We don't sell toys. Um, you know, and all the other different industries out, industries out there, we actually save people's lives. So the fact that we're there's so much infighting and cutthroat behavior, I think that's what makes us go, what the fuck? Yeah. Like why, dude? We're all in the same boat and we only got one. So, um, you know, like the recent you probably saw some of the recent crap on the internet with, with us being called out. I did, and, I watched that. And it's like, okay, well let's have a let's have an adult conversation. Yeah. Let's have a beautiful argument if necessary. I heard that term one time, I was like, That's yeah, there's no reason why we can't have a beautiful argument or you know, or agreement. I mean, yeah, you know, I, I started this podcast with the intention and the, and the goal of, you know, sitting down with people like you, but also people sitting down with some folks that maybe don't think like me, you know, and I have some very strong views, especially with the second amendment and gun control and everything else. And, you know, those of you who know my story, you know, like what I've done with, you know, gun owners of California, gun owners of America and testifying and everything else. I'm very passionate about that, but there, there's some other people that are just as passionate on the other side of the table. And I want to sit down and have a grown up conversation with them and I think that's okay to agree to disagree and we can still be friends even though our ideologies and stuff don't necessarily line up 100%. Well, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, you could totally have an argument, a blatant outright argument with somebody that you respect. Right? Respect. It's, it's when it's when the respect fails and yeah. then now now it's like don't have a conversation with with a person that you don't respect. Yeah. Right? That's hard to do that. Um so you have to find some level of respect yeah, so I think I don't. It's not like you know you gotta. Res I'm not talking about the uh, I can't respect the other side kind of thing, left or right, gay, straight, black, white, right. all the crap that we have in the world nowadays. That's just that's just infighting and cognitive dissonance and lack of understanding and education. And um, yeah, I'm not talking about you know the the respect aspect from you know the left versus the right and the gay versus straight and the freaking black versus white and all the other crap that we have going on in our world. Um, um, you know that's that's a bunch of bunch of bullshit that's a lack of education that's fear mongering that's um common enemy intimacy that's created amongst a lot of people and i think that's one of the big things in our industry that happens is you you create this common enemy right and this this aspect of of common enemy intimacy is if if i said hey dude you know and we see these people like the other day um hey that dude's a piece of shit yeah so if you're gonna talk shit about him do it next to me right and we come together we have nothing in common bro except this thing that we're intimate about hating, right? So that's that's a way that, um, you know, describes, I think, one of the biggest problems between all those things that I just said, left versus right. Hey, the Democrats are bad because of this. Hey, the Republicans are bad because of that. Hey, the military is bad because of this. Like, look at the Navy versus Marine fights all the time. Look at cops versus firemen fights. This is all common enemy intimacy. Right. From other assholes trying to pull you into a group to say, hey, screw them, let's talk shit about them at the same time. Um, that's a lot of what's going on, which is why the haters... And the fans of the haters, um, who we would think are disrespectful, right? Um, they're piss ants. And I think that's the biggest thing here. And I'll, I'll try to keep this short because I know we're running out of time. But a piss ant is an interesting thing. It's an actual ant, okay? And it's an ant in Europe and Africa that, 
that has this horrible smell of of uh, of when it's you know around its mounds. The urine smells really bad, it's like toxic. Yeah. And uh, and I'll tell you, man, from experience, like you will wonder how something so small can stink that bad. Yeah. And you'll wonder so much till you will go over to the mound to see why something so small smells so bad, and you'll all of a sudden start getting bit by all the piss ants, right? Because you wandered into their world. That's the first way I don't deal with haters is I don't deal with them. Because number one, I feel sorry for a lot of them. Yeah. The ones that, that are not respectable, okay? The ones that meaning, because I'm sure they'll be like, well, we don't respect you either. That's cool. But once you to. learn my world and you learn what real morals and ethics are and you understand compassion and vulnerability that we live around, I think those are pretty good ideas versus the opposite of those things, right? Yeah. A lack of compassion, a lack of vulnerability. People can't stand up and say what they're doing wrong. They can never admit what's wrong, you know? Uh, with themselves because they're narcissists and that's another big problem we have a lot of narcissistic Absolutely. assholes like malignant narcissists in our industry and all they care about is themselves their fame their influence you know you, you dealt with it a couple weeks ago <laughs> yeah well i mean one of those guys is not respectable in the community whatsoever the other one is um but uh and i don't and again so somebody he, he or anybody never has the right to demand my respect because i do not respect um unrespectable people yeah. right so with that, I think going back to the piss ant is I think they should hear this. And I hope they listen because a piss ant is an efficate for a inconsequential, irrelevant or worthless person who's contemptible out of proportion to his or her preconceived significance. Now, what that means in a nutshell, in layman's terms, is that this person thinks they're such big shit, but they're really not. Because they don't have good morals, they don't have good ethics, they don't give a fuck about anybody, they don't care. Right. Right. Which is the whole reason why we do our jobs. And, uh, and they'll never admit when they're wrong. Okay, that's a piss ant. That yeah. person will literally think they're the best thing on the, the face of the planet. And so they're contemptible out of proportion to their perceived significance. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and you should never give them the satisfaction. No, that's, that's, that's great advice, you know, especially for, you know, shooters, you know, uh, just getting into it. You know, I see a lot of forums, people asking simple questions and they get attacked. They don't know any better. That's why they're coming to these forums. Well, there's other people that are supposed to lead them in the right direction. There's no, there's no silly question to me. Mm -hmm. You know, and I can't stand bullies. I told you that before. Every fight I got into growing up was with bullies. You know, I can't stand bullies. And I, I go into these forums sometimes and I just shake my head and I see these comments. I can't help but to get involved sometimes. Yeah. You know, and I've shot people, my personal contact, you know, just saying, hey, give me a call, you know, because, hey, you're safe with me, man. Let's, you know, let, let's do this, especially with women, man, for, for whatever reason. Women get attacked. Mm -hmm. when they get into shooting and they're just like. You know, asking, hey, what gun? Or I, I just bought this gun, and, you know, is it is it a good one? Oh, you should have bought this. And why didn't you get this? Maybe she couldn't afford that, you know? Maybe, maybe the high point was the only thing she could get. Train with it. Yeah, that, that's got to stop, too. It, it does. Know? It absolutely does. Yeah, there's does. a lot of crappy guns out there. We get it. But it's a lot of them still shoot. And so a lot of people can't afford, and they don't understand. And then, But the problem is, instead of, again, sharing and saying, hey, you ever thought about getting into this more and I can share some better equipment for you that's yeah. going to be more reliable and instead of going, oh, you're a freaking idiot and you bought that or you do this or you go to that person's class or you're, I mean, I hear I hear it all the time, you know, even in departments. It's, it gets yeah. that bad of level. Oh, yeah, you're with that department, ha, ha. It's like, yeah. well, how do you know what's going on over there? Yeah. You got your own problems, man. Yeah. Um, so people, I, I think or, that's where you're creating an enemy right there before it's even time and why we have so yeah. many groups and subcultures in our shooting world is because nobody's... Um, Nobody knows how to get along right. anymore. You know, it's a serious problem. Yeah. So, I again, yeah, I, I don't give them the satisfaction. It used to bother me because I think it bothers everybody. Eventually, you see comments like, what am I doing wrong? Like, what, why would somebody just blatantly put that horrible thing about me or my family? It's some bad shit that goes on the Internet. And yeah. to the point where it's like, you know, you know, F you and your whole family. I hope they die of whatever, of, of the fleas of a thousand camels and bullshit like that. It's like, okay, why would people... Oh, I know why. Because they feel sorry for themselves. Because that's their own issues. And that's what creates the bully aspect, which we all know from being little kids. Um, so feel sorry for those people. Help them. Help them. Right? Yeah. Um, you know, like Juice Box the other day, I'm like, hey, man, take your glasses off so I can see your eyes. And he still can't do that. He has to put them back on and blame the fans. For his fans. To, hey, the fans want them back on. Like, that's called malignant overt narcissism, brother. And you mm -hmm. got to see that. And if you don't see that, you'll never care about yourself. And if you really, truly can't care about yourself, you'll never learn what the true love for yourself is. And therefore, you will never be able to help anybody else. Yeah, and I hope that person changes, honestly. I mean, oh, I do too. Because, you know, I wish him the best. Because Extremely talented. He has a following, you know. And, and yeah, you know, I mean, 
he can change, you yeah. know, and it's just, it's a turnoff to a lot of people, but some people like that stuff. Some people feed on that stuff. They do. And that's why I don't want to get, you know, I'm sure people are like, well, don't even start in the comments going, Hey, what's his name? What's his name? Cause we're not going to tell you. Cause you can figure it out on your own. If you really want to waste your time trying to go give the piss ant satisfaction. Yeah. It's out there. I think it's the principle of that. What we're talking about here that I want people to understand is the principle of how to, you know, deal with care about, cause I still care about that person. Absolutely. That person is still in my industry. They're still in my country. Right. And, uh, and as a fellow American, I want to help that person who is literally helping other people learn how to, to defend themselves. And I hope, I hope they get something out of what he's teaching, but I think he could give so much more. All yeah. of us, all of us could give so much more. You uh, know, and it comes down to com compassion. You know, I, I, I've gotten to know you pretty well and, and, and been very impressed with your drive and your heart, but you know, let's, let's tell our viewers, you know, what, what is it that drives Travis Haley, you know, in, in business and, and. In everything you do, why do you do what you do, man? What's important to you? Well, I think first the mere fact that I'm going to die one day creates the focus of how I'm going to live. Yeah. It's powerful. So, yeah, I, uh, and with that, you could probably tell there's a lot of, a lot of story behind that, you know, of what makes me think that way. Cause I never did. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, man. I mean, God, uh, you know, being away from family a lot, yeah. you know, um, trying to learn that, you know, over many, 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 many years, learning the hard way that you can't save the world. <laughs> so you got to take it one day at a time, you know, one and person uh, at a time sometimes. one person at a time and really help. So, yeah, I'm not saying that, you know, all the, the things that, you know, happens to, you know, a lot of these people that we're talking about in the world, I've never done. Yeah, of course, I've had narcissistic moments. We all do. We all have a level of that. Um, I've had moments where I kind of abandoned my core, hence the train station, you know, which is a story for another time. Um, you know, that's why I keep these reminders around me every day. It's, and it's not, you know, I love the Stoics. I've, I've studied the Stoics and I've studied a lot of different people in, in the past, especially warrior culture from thousands of years back as far as I can, can research. Um, you know, they, they kind of had that concept of today you may die, man. So yeah. memento mori, right? Like, you know, you, you know, don't just take that and look at it as some, you know, cheesy cliche saying, no, that's a real thing, man. Nobody gets off the spaceship alive. And, uh, you know, and if you have, you have ideas, you have dreams, you have ambitions, well, just you either do it or you don't, because again, that's where people go 10 years from now. Hey, you're going to be 10 years older. So what are you going to be then? Let that drive you because either I might right. be dead or maybe I get that 10 years. So what do I prove to myself in those 10 years? And some people just don't live that kind of life. Some people don't need to prove anything, you know, yeah. and, and I'm not saying I have to prove anything to anybody. Um, if I have to prove anything, it's that I'm worthy of something, you know, Yes, you are. of, and a lot of people, I guess will have problems seeing that is of this life, this one in 400 trillion chance to become a fucking human being. Yeah. Why would you not live that to its fullest? to its fullest that doesn't mean cut it short you know i'm dealing with a lot of suicide and stuff right now in the community um live it to its fullest and that fullness is going to hurt man it's going to hurt bad it's going to it's going to you're going to suffer yeah um you know and i think those are the things that keep me driving every day as well is working on the constant suffering that i have and uh, and i love it as you know, bad as it hurts i love it every day everything everything you had to go through man and i know i know some of the things that you've shared with me personally um it got you to where you're at today, you know, and it gives you that influence with people and to build people. And that's why I, I, you know, that's why I'm aligning myself with you and your family and your team, you know, and I'll always have your back because I see what drives you and I see the fact that you want to pour into people. And that's what I love about you. You know, that's that's something that I try to live my life by and everything I do, yeah. whether it's at work or in my personal life, my phone's always on for people that I know and, and have it, you know, it's like. I'm always willing to, to put myself out there to help somebody because, like you said, man, at the end of the day, when our life is over, what's it all worth? Yeah. Right? What's it all worth? You can't take, you can't take money with you. You can't take your belongings with you. You know, I, I'm trying to leave a legacy. And how do I do that? You know, it's one person at a time. Right? That's right. That's your memory. I'm happy. You've heard me say I'm happy helping one person, man. Yeah. But I but I know I can help any more. Yeah. And uh and I know I will always continue to do that. And when I do that, I'll have I'll have the ability to reconcile with suffering because I'm sharing that. That's what I kept, you know, saying earlier in the start of this podcast is if you learn to share, 
you'll also get through the things that hopefully you don't have to deal with like some of us have in our yeah. lives. Um, but I'll tell you, when you find reconciliation in that suffering because you simply accepted it for what it is yeah. and that it happened and it happened exactly the way it happened and it didn't happen the other way. You know why? Because it didn't. Right. <laughs> so you could try to make excuse after excuse. Um, but that happened. Yeah. And why did it happen? Because that's a part of your life. And that's, the I think, the only way to you know, reconcile with suffering is is uh maybe more suffering now that sounds kind of harsh sometimes you just got to trust the process i think you have to realize that you know let let me ask you this right you're how old are you right now 40 are you done suffering in your life rob no (laughs) why you're 40 man it's downhill from here you just kind of chill take it easy live in the camper world life all your life (laughs) (laughs) remote location we're sitting outside his house right now (laughs) acting like we're out in the wilderness but we are seriously remote location but like so that you know obviously you will suffer yeah absolutely man you're gonna see more bad shit go through more bad shit so why would you think that one day I won't may, maybe all of a sudden be able to take it. So I think the the concept there is dealing with more suffering will eventually make you look back on this one in hindsight and go, man, I went through that thing, whatever it was, even though I didn't understand the adversity at the time of what I was going through, but holy shit, that actually was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. That's what you will say, right? And so I think that's what keeps me going as well to answer your last question is I want to just see what, what happens, man with my life that's it i always want my here to see what happens yeah you know and i think more suffering is going to allow me to deal with the shit that i'm dealing with right now harshly and go wow that was nothing because i like that journey of up and it's a roller coaster we were at my wedding last night and i got to watch my bride walk down that aisle and she looked absolutely gorgeous and there was a lot of people there celebrating with us and, and supporting us but you know it took a lot of suffering to get there and you know with lisa and i you know i i'm i'm very aware of everything that had to take place it had to have happened for us to be where we're at and so that i'm thankful for now if you'd asked me 10 years ago am i thankful for what i'm going through no it was miserable but now getting through it and i got through it and a lot of people listening you're going to get through it you're going to wake up one day and you're going to go wow and whatever it is you're going to see you're going to look up and you're going to go i get it i get it you know, so Travis, Dude, I know, I know we're putting times, man. man. Thank you, sir. And uh, I'm so glad you're here, man. I'm honored to be a friend. I'm honored to be a brother. And, uh, you know, I love you, bro. Thank you, bro. So, I love you too, man. All right. If you like this episode, be sure to like, share, and subscribe to this channel. We have some exciting guests coming on the show and look forward to bringing you some more amazing content very soon. So stay tuned.